That that's so interesting. Um, how we're starting to get involved in politics and all that now. It is very interesting indeed, and it's not something that I would have uh, guessed uh, would be on my bingo card for this year. But um, it is it is one of those things where uh, we've actually been pulled in from uh, members of the government who heard about Sigma Prime, who heard about the work that we do, and deemed that we you know, should be involved and should be providing input, uh, which is absolutely great. Let me let me just say that. I've been involved in similar conversations in other jurisdictions, France mostly, and uh, let's just say that the approach is very different. <laughs> it, it really felt like sometimes hmm. talking to a wall, whereas here uh, our concerns are heard and hopefully addressed. So we'll see how that goes. But it is it is a long process. Um, it'll take another 18 months until uh, perhaps we were impacted. So, you know, just trying to be proactive and making sure that our operations mm. remain in Australia because, you know, we like it here. We're headquartered yep. here. Um, a lot of people were suggesting that we should relocate a while ago for various purposes, uh, you know, tax optimization and regulatory certainty. But, uh, yeah, no, we've always been comfortable operating here and paying all our taxes here. So hopefully that that can remain the, the way Sigma Prime operates. We'll find out soon. <laughs> mm, yeah, nice, nice. So your feeling is the regulatory landscape in Australia is actually pretty friendly to crypto as opposed to like the US or something where they're doing a lot of it, enforcement it, it's, actions. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I think a lot of it will be dependent on this bill. So if, if we manage to essentially carve out exceptions for non-custodian providers or self-custody providers, then we should probably end up in a good place. My concern is the, you know, uh, label everything crypto kind of thing and require people to comply with financial services laws regardless of how they're approaching um, the actual uh, problem. So we'll see how, how it goes, but I, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic walking out of this meeting. Um, it, was, it was very constructive. Um, I, can't, I can't say, obviously, there was someone from ASIC in the, in the meeting as well. Um, so ASIC is the Australian SEC. Um, so they also provided some you know, insights on um, how we could navigate this uh, if we should have shot. Was Austrac there as well? Nope. Austrac was, but Austrac was part of uh, that crypto assembly a couple of weeks ago in Sydney. Um, they were in the room as well. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Why don't we start with a bit about your background on uh, sure. what you were doing before Sigma Prime? Yeah. Uh, sounds good. Uh, so prior to starting uh, CGP. I was a penetration tester, um, or an off offensive security researcher, working for a big four company. Um, I've spent six years of my professional life at that place, uh, three years in Paris, and then had enough of Paris. Us, we transferred in Sydney, spent three years in Sydney working for those folks, um, essentially doing um, you know, penetration testing activities, finding bugs in our clients' uh, websites, mobile apps, um, external networks, internal networks, and so on. Um, some fun red teaming, some fun social engineering engagement, physical security as well was often in scope. Um, so that was that was great. Uh, that was basically, that was my first job uh, out of here. So straight out of uni, I worked, worked for these guys in Paris. And uh, yeah, transferred to Sydney and then you know, met my co-founders, but we'll probably get to that later. Yeah, nice. Um, that's pretty similar uh, to my background as well. Yeah. And I was talking to you earlier, yeah, like we had really similar backgrounds, but you're just uh, uh, many years earlier than, than myself. <laughs> I guess I was just lucky enough to meet people who um, knew about Ethereum very early on and sort of, you know, explained to me how that chain works and how it's different from Bitcoin. I was aware of Bitcoin. I had researched it prior to uh, moving to Australia, actually, but it never really blown my mind. Like, I was like, oh yeah, cool. There's this, you know, cryptocurrency thing. Um, and I remember Ethereum, I remember the first time Ethereum was explained to me, it was a 
some sort of like life changing uh, moment where my brain just lit up. And uh, from that day, I was basically spending all the time I could researching, understanding the EVM, understanding um, the, the client architectures. And um, very early on, Martin Swende uh, was pushing a lot of blog posts on the security implications of um, smart contracts. Um, this was back in 2016, I want to say, 2015, 2016. Um, so yeah, quite early on, I realized that, yeah, that was a potential opportunity here uh, because the, the security space, the blockchain security space was pretty much inexistent, right? Um, people were still figuring things out. Um, then the DAO hack happened that kind of made it apparent and obvious to everyone that there's a massive need for security services in this space. Um, so yeah, I guess I got, I got, I got quite lucky. I met the right people at the right time. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So that was around 2017, uh, when you started, uh, Sigma prime, is that right? Yeah. So it was incorporated, um, in, uh, 2016 actually. Um, it was incorporated in 2016 before the incorporation, we were basically doing a lot of stuff on the side that makes sense. We were, um, each one of us had day jobs or university degrees that were pursued. Um, and, uh, yeah, for about maybe nine months, you know, we were running the Sydney Ethereum meetup, um, giving sort of pro bono ad hoc advice to various, uh, startups, uh, based in Sydney. Um, you know, synthetics back then was called Haven. It's kind of one of them. There's this project that I remember called Horizon State, um, which was meant to tackle on-chain voting. Um, so yeah, those were some of the first initiatives we were involved with. Um, but then yeah, quickly realized that there was a massive market, um, that was, uh, emerging and perhaps more importantly, we were like extremely passionate about this stuff and we were just like constantly working on this. And it, did not feel like work. We were really enjoying ourselves. Um, so yeah, after some time, we kind of decided, everyone decided to drop their primary jobs and just commit to Sigma Prime full-time. And I think it worked out all right. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I would say so. Now, so originally you guys were performing mostly security reviews, is that right? And um, then started developing Lighthouse yeah, so actually the very early stages that sort of my first months that I was uh, mentioning, we weren't solely focused on security. We were doing a bunch of um, what we used to call consulting around the crypto space in Sydney. So helping, you know, startups, but also very established businesses think about use cases on Ethereum primarily. Um, so lots of you know, token designs, sometimes we even, you know, help some of our clients write smart contracts, um, but also obviously a little bit of security. Um, we've very quickly decided to focus on security exclusively in the, in the um, I guess, the services side of the company. Um, you know, I kind of decided that security was our expertise and there was a need in the ecosystem for more security professionals. Um, and that's where we, we came in. Um, it was, it was an easy decision because some of those early projects, the consulting projects were, how can I say frustrating, uh, like the better word, uh, in the sense that very rarely you would see that proof of concept turn into an actual production application. Um, so, you know, spending a lot of time discussing, you know, designs and features and at the end of the day, you know, like doing this for a large bank, for example, we've done that for one of the big four banks here in Australia, um, you know, a few months later, that project was completely ditched and, uh, everyone there moved on to something else. And, you know, it was, it was this, this like weird taste left in our mouths of like just an achieved work, um, with security, it's obviously very different. Um, so yeah, focused on security, decided to really position ourselves as a security firm in the blockchain space. And the lighthouse story is actually quite funny. Um, <laughs> Uh, so Lighthouse started as a side project from Paul, one of my co-founders. Um, and Paul, you know, tends to, uh, spend, uh, holidays with his family 
and apparently he's always keen to take a, a side project with him to those uh, family holidays. And what he did was um, essentially build a JavaScript simulator for uh, Casper CBC. So Casper CBC, CBC stands for correct by construction, was a version of the consensus mechanism powering Ethereum today that was being worked on by Vlad, Vlad Zamfir. And there was a need for like implementing and starting prototyping. So that's what he started doing. Okay, I'll you know just start uh, coding, coding whatever the researchers have in mind, um, and you know kind of sig signaled his um, intention and uh, willingness to dive deeper into the implementation side of what the EF was researching. Um, and uh, yeah, he quickly moved on to uh, work on proof of stake. So the, the Casper version that we basically have now in the protocol, also dubbed as LMD ghost technicalities. Um, and uh, yeah, started, you know, pumping out great code. Obviously that got a lot of uh, attention from certain people at the Ethereum Foundation. One of them was Danny Ryan. And uh, the story goes, both of them were in Japan at the same time, just for like random complete completely different reasons. Um, and they found out that they were in Japan at the same time, so they decided to just meet up. And then I guess uh, that was a very fruitful meeting because uh, that kind of um, showed that there was, for to us at least, that there was a very strong need for a, another sort of strong client implementation. Um, so basically, you know, Danny told Paul was like, you should do this, like you should really turn this prototyping into like fully fledged client and uh, we, the foundation will be supportive. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, so Paul and Adrian worked very, very hard at the beginning and like, you know, probably coding 95% of the code base for the first few months. Then we started hiring people and uh, quite quickly turned into a dedicated team within Sigma Prime. And uh, yeah, I think uh, it was a great, great decision. Lighthouse is currently responsible for about 34, 35% of the Ethereum blocks produced, uh, which is, which is insane. Like if you had told me this seven years ago, <laughs> um, I, I, I wouldn't have believed you, but um, it is a massive achievement. Big kudos to everyone involved on the Lighthouse side. Um, big responsibility as well. Um, but uh, yeah, very, very proud of it that side of the company has been able to achieve. <laughs> nice. So you were mainly working on the security yeah. side of things while Paul yeah. um, and Adrian was working on the lighthouse uh, side of things. Yeah, Adrian has always had that, um, those two hats, so the ability to sort of swap from, you know, Rust development to uh, security assessments wherever he's needed the most. Um, I have not contributed so much to the, I guess, the client development. I've helped on other fronts, um, things like you know, security. Obviously, we're a security company, so we want to make sure that our software is as secure as it possibly can be. So I've done a bunch of internal due diligence back in the day, lots of you know, fuzzing on Lighthouse, uh, some manual reviews of Lighthouse, and then just, I guess, a uh, bunch of outreach, you know, talking about Lighthouse on conferences and spreading the good word. Um, but as you know, my focus at Sigma Prime is uh, heavily, heavily on the security assessment side of our business. Yeah, and now the the political side as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll see for how long that goes. But uh, yeah, actually, I, I think it's quite interesting. Um, I had those cliches, you know, about like people, like politicians, um, drafting bills and uh, proposing legislation without necessarily... Uh, engaging with the industry, at least that was my misconception back then, but it's it's actually quite refreshing to see how the Australian government is going about um, drafting crypto legislation, to be quite frank. Mm. Yeah, nice, nice. Um, so how was the security industry like back in the day? Um, obviously, you are very early into that. Was there a lot of demand at that time? Interesting. Um... There wasn't so much, no, let's just say, there wasn't as much activity, obviously, on the chain as there is today, right? Um, I could, probably we could 
back then probably enumerate the number of smart contracts that were uh, meaningful smart contracts that were deployed on Ethereum. So I, I don't think you can compare obviously the level of demand back then with the level of demand today. Uh, but on the other hand, there weren't that many professionals in the space. So there's this uh, security telegram channel that's about 3,500, 4,000 members. Now today, we were added back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, or 2018, uh, and we were, uh, you know, people number 22, 23 and 24, Adrian, Paul and myself to be added to that group. So very early on, I guess. Um, there was some work which was um, kind of identified through the Ethereum Sydney meetup. Uh, so as I said, you know, we would walk up to the at Sydney meetup, we would um, talk about some of the research that we've been doing, talk about, provide an update to the community. And um, yeah, started noticing that a few people were very keen on building smart contracts. And uh, because they knew we sort of had that nascent expertise, um, they would reach out to us. And that's how we, I guess, get our first client engagements on actual smart contract security reviews. Right, right. Yeah, I felt the security industry was still very small when I first uh, started getting into it early 2022. Uh, for example, just on Code Arena, there were only like 200 people uh, even doing contests at that time. Uh, yeah, I, I would imagine it would be pretty hard to find talent uh, around 2017 as well. Oh, it, it was so hard. It was... Like, <laughs> you couldn't expect, obviously, to be able to hire people that had the knowledge. The knowledge was still being sort of developed and was being born, really, at that time. Uh, so the approach we took was very different. Uh, we hired people, clever people, that were interested in blockchain tech with a relatively strong security background, and we taught them blockchain, basically. Um, and that worked out really well. Um, and we, you know, started hiring some relatively young slash inexperienced people, you know, someone from fresh out of university, but they had, they had the willingness to, you know, dive deep into the complexity and the curiosity to, um, approach these complex topics. At least they, they looked extremely complex to us back then, <laughs> looking back at some of that stuff, back at what we do now, um, probably fair to say that the complexity now has increased by at least a couple of orders of magnitude but um yeah that was that was our approach uh, we knew that we wouldn't be able to hire um professionals that have actual blockchain security expertise so we just you know spoke with security minded people and gauged whether there was an interest in learning blockchain that's what we did uh, some of them you know spent you know three six months uh, just learning, 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 researching and understanding the EVM. And that paid off. Um, some of our best security assessors uh, have gone through this process. Um, and we kind of started just domestically. So initially Sigma Prime was um, operating in Australia. We'd, had, we'd have clients overseas, but everyone working with Sigma Prime would be um, based in Australia. Uh, in Sydney, actually, um, and you know, as the company grew, as the market grew, we've realized that it was it was probably not smart to constrain ourselves into the domestic market when it comes to talent. So, started hiring people overseas, and uh, well, now we have obviously more people outside of Australia than in Australia, um, but um, we're still headquartered here. Um, even though we've recently, as you know, made the move to be fully remote, um, have ditched our Sydney office. So that's, uh, I guess, an exciting uh, chapter for Sigma Prime as well. Mm, yeah. Uh, I would imagine back then you would almost have to try to sell the idea of Web3 and try to get people interested um, to join this industry rather than, you know, then already passionate about it and then coming you for coming to you for opportunities and yeah it's really kind of flipped yes <laughs> absolutely um it was let's put it this way it was there was a lot of skepticism uh for good reasons right um so within the um i guess the technical community there was a fair bit of skepticism and essentially the strategy we took was debunk a lot of that and just dive into the complexities and um, sort of 
open the core of this thing and explain to people why this is something that will have the potential to actually change the world. Uh, and we really, really meant it, you know. We still are very, very passionate about this stuff. <laughs> um, and it worked. It worked. So a lot of people that we've hired were like, oh, yeah, I, I get it now. I can see past the token flipping and the ICO craze. There's actually cool tech to be worked on here. Um, and, you know, some, some of the brightest minds that Sigma Prime have not necessarily come from the crypto sort of crypto native background. They've turned into crypto folks, uh, but we're just very strong software engineers, strong security engineers. Uh, and I guess we've managed to create that little spark in, in their eyes. And, uh, and yeah, they're, they're, I hope, loving what they do today. Mm. Did you or any of your founders have that skepticism when first, uh, when you guys first discovered this industry? That's a good, good question. I, I had some of that. I had some of that skepticism coming from the Web2 security world, um, having researched Bitcoin. Yeah, there was a lot of altcoins as well popping up. Ethereum was kind of like, oh, another one of them. <laughs> but then, uh, as I said, I was lucky enough to uh, you know, be hanging out with some great folks who were like, no, 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 no. Ethereum is not like the other ones. And here is why. And um, I think doing doing the homework, doing the research allows you to you know clear those misconceptions and um, and yeah allowed me to form my opinion on, on the matter and, and and my belief in in this this technology. Mm, yeah, nice, nice. Um, I guess now um, we've just gone through a round of internship hiring and. Yes. Um, yeah, we've definitely seen the increase in both the interest in getting into the Web3 security space and um, just the talent, the amount of talent that's out there. Uh, did it surprise you how many people were interested in now compared to, to before? Man, it, was, it was pretty wild, hey? How many, how many responses did we get? How many applications? I think we got about 190 or 188 uh, applicants for an internship. Um, it was humbling. Uh, it was. It was. I did. I did not expect um, necessarily to get. Well, let me put it this way. It's not so much the number of applicants. It's the quality of the applications we've received. Um, it was. It was quite mind blowing. Like people who have already demonstrated their skills in the Web three space, be it you know successful bug bounty hunters or actual security researchers working at other security, blockchain security firms um, applying to intern with us. Um, so yeah, I, I did not see that coming. <laughs> uh, originally I was you know, envisioning a whole bunch of people without much experience and exposure to the Web3 security space. And that's what the internship was sort of meant to be about, right? Like just kind of getting you started into the space, sharing with you our methodology and getting you to shadow some of our testers. Um, but the caliber of some of those applicants was, was astonishing. And um, yeah, uh, it took a while going through all of them. I've, uh, I've personally gone through <laughs> the 188 applications, um, but it was all worth it. I'll you know, do it again. Um, I wish we had the ability to take on more, like if, if capacity was not an issue, uh, we could have probably, like half of those applications probably deserved a slot with us just based on merit. But as you know, we're a relatively small team and obviously we can't, we can't take on um, 90 interns. So uh, we had to be selective. It was a very, very selective process. It was one of the most selective process I've been involved in when it comes to hiring. Uh, but I'm extremely excited um, for the people who have joined us. So we've got two, this time of recording, I guess, two people uh, who are interning with us and we'll have two more join us in the coming weeks. Um, the two people who are already here, you know, have very much already demonstrated their um, willingness to, you know, tackle complex issues and, um, exemplary attitude and people have already passed on feedback to me that they're you know great people to work with so yeah 
Um, my hope is that we can do that more and more and more and just hopefully try to give back to um, the, the, the community that way. Mm, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with um, some of them and yeah, really good experience. Awesome. And uh, what would you give as advice or, or I guess your hiring criteria as you've gone through this hiring process? Because as uh, this industry grows, there would be more interest uh, of people mm. trying to join this industry. And just for those people listening, what would you uh, give to those people as advice? As you said, it's it's getting, it's getting very competitive. Uh, I would not say that the Web three security space is crowded. By the way, I, I think we need we need a lot more uh, practitioners to be able to tackle the challenges ahead. Uh, but as of today, um, I think you know, obviously, depending on your level of uh, expertise or level of technical knowledge, um, you know, start simple, understand Solidity understand the EVM, make sure you know um, how to write contracts and how to read contracts, um, go through a bunch of exercises that are out there, so many amazing CTFs, so many amazing write-ups of um, unfortunately exploited live bugs or just um, research that came out of uh, a bunch of practitioners. Um, there's there's a lot out there, and I guess the challenge is to prioritize um, and select which um, resources you should be spending your time on. Um, we've kind of done that for a few people. We've actually had people reach out to us and be like, "Hey, this is this way too much information out there. How how can I how can I get started?" Um, so I remember putting together a little document um, that. Um, I guess prioritizes those resources, but that's just sort of my personal prioritization. Um, one thing I'd like to add as well is that the Web2 security background, I think, helped me a lot in uh, getting where I am today. And, I'm, and I know it's helped you as well. As you mentioned, Andy, we have uh, very similar backgrounds. Um, it's helped you, you know, tackle some of the perhaps more complex uh, DeFi protocols and find some perhaps of the more complex issues. And that's not something I've seen um, sort of preached a lot in our space. Uh, people tend to just focus on like Web3 and they're like, no, I, I'm just going to be a, a gun at Solidity. I'm just going to be a gun at EVM intricacies. Uh, but I genuinely think that a decent overall traditional security background is is essential. Um, you you, you want to be able to find bugs in various systems, not only just on-chain contracts. As you know, at CDP, we do a lot of off-chain security for blockchain networks, right? We do a lot of work on L1 clients, L2 clients, bridges and whatnot. Those pieces of software are written in Rust, Go, C++, TypeScript. They're not you know, on-chain code. Um, and to me, if I'm interviewing people and I'm going through applications and I can spot that someone doesn't necessarily have the ability to go through these complex systems, but at least has you know, Golang security ex experience or Rust security experience, that is a key differentiator. Um, because a lot of people are really, really good at Solidity security, at EVM security. Not as many are competent when it comes to off-chain systems. Perhaps you would argue they're maybe more complex in some cases. The code bases are larger. The dependencies are more intricate. Um, so, you know, having that would be my advice for people. Obviously, go through Solidity, go through the on-chain stuff. But if you want to differentiate yourself learn Rust security, learn Golang security, and be comfortable with uh, web security, web to security um, as a whole, you know, things like cross-site scripting attacks, SQL injections, like all that sort of stuff, you may not apply directly to your web three security uh, job, but it'll help you in the long run, for sure. Just think in terms of abstracting the complexity and thinking about, you know, different layers and how to poke them. And I, th I think that, experience is really valuable mm, yeah i agree uh web 2 security experience uh, definitely helps um transition into web 3 uh, but I, the thing i've noticed is just 
that a lot of people who are getting into Web3 security, they're really young and they don't really necessarily have that prior experience. They're just uh, getting straight into Web3 security, which is a pretty interesting um, thing I've observed. I agree. I, I, I was trying to find like a, another industry that had the ability to attract so much young talent. Um, I, I, I can't think of one that would rival the Web3 space, to be quite frank. Um, and we could probably speculate as to why. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing, right? Like people get into this space super young, which is super exciting, right? Um, and, you know, some of them tend to focus on on-chain stuff and Solidity exclusively, and it's absolutely fine. Like it's, if that's what you want to do, you just want to be an expert in that side of the field, your call. Uh, but, um, you know, if you're asking me about uh, advice for people who are trying to break into the space and potentially, like, apply at firms like ours, um, that, that would be my advice. Do not... Do not limit yourself to one stack, to one language, to one technology. Try to be curious about all the other cool stuff that's out there. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely good advice. Uh, and I guess another aspect uh, of people with a Web2 security background is uh, I think the established people who are really good at what they do in Web2, they have they're the people with most skepticism in Web3 and they don't necessarily want to jump into this industry. Uh, but I've seen people with extensive Web2 experience come in to Web3 and just immediately rocket up um, into a fantastic security researcher. Uh, so yeah, there's definitely that factor to, to consider as totally. well. So the thesis is obviously if we are to go through another bull run, um, projects will be funded right? Um, a lot more than what they are today, uh, which means that there's going to be a lot more things to review from a security standpoint, right? Um, so, and it's and it's historically something that we've seen at Singapore. Prime. I remember one of my talks at SCC was overlaying the market cap of the crypto market cap and our, um, I guess, number of projects each year. And you can see there's a lag of like three months every time there's a massive spike in crypto prices. Three months later, there's a lot of security assessments requested. Um, so even if like we're, we're probably getting out of a bear market, getting into a bull market, I'm not going to get into that now. But um, if those people, you know, those 2,000, 3,000 people are, are, you know, sharpening their skills, uh, it may seem that there may not be enough work for everyone right now. But I'm very confident in like what what's what's going to happen if we uh, go through another bull run. It's just we've seen this at CP. Like sometimes, I think it was 2021, we were booked for, I think, eight months, booked out for like eight months, which is ridiculous, right? Like if you talk about like professional services, that's just madness. Um, and, and, it's, and it's sad because that means that all those projects that we can't take on, well, I've seen some of them go live and get exploited. And I feel terrible, right? Because they asked me for help. I wasn't able to help. And then guess what happened? They got popped. So that's why I'd like to see, I'd like to see more uh, security professionals than needed right now, uh, because I anticipate what happened uh, a couple of years ago to happen again. Um, so for those of you who yeah. are getting into the space, um, for those of you who are submitting um, bugs on you know, C4 in Unify, um, it's keep, keep doing the hard work, keep, keep grinding. Um, it, you may not be able to break into a security firm right now, but I, I do expect uh, Sigma Prime and you know all the sisters, sister companies in the space to um, tremendously have to scale things up at some point in the very near future. That's just me being optimistic and thinking that we're going to have another bull market again, but who knows? Mm. Yeah, that's, I guess that's the unfortunate reality of working in a market that's extremely cyclical uh, and that yes. really impacts the security assessments. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what do you see as um, 
really good niches to get into um, in terms of uh, Web3 security. Uh, I know that uh, internally within SIGP, we are doing a big push towards uh, R&D, towards ZK. Um, do you see that as an area that would be having a big demand in the future? Um, yes, absolutely. I kind of feel that the ZK space right now is where the solidity space was at five years ago or six years ago, meaning that there's not so much tooling, we're still figuring out best practices, we're still coming up with, you know, I wouldn't say standards, but like commonly shared ways of doing things. Um, and it just has that same vibe. <laughs> and it's also super fascinating. Um, to me, that's also a technology that does have the power to actually change things dramatically in how we operate, how we do business, how we connect, how we share information. Um, so as you know, as I've told everyone at CQP, I do believe that uh, positioning ourselves as a you know very, very good security assessor, security provider for that stack will pay off in the long run. Um, also, it's just fascinating tech. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the people at CQP who have had the time to research ZK, you know, dive into things like Cairo, dive into things like Tyco and all that, they've, all the ones at least I've spoken to about this came back to me and said, this is mind blowing. This is actually gonna, you know, change things. Um, so, you know, I'm very happy that a lot of us are going through that upskilling. Um, obviously, in like business context, it kind of makes sense. But just purely from an intellectual uh, curiosity, uh, I think that's super important. I want everyone here to just have fun primarily, right? Like some of us have been, well, I've been here for seven years, right? But like some, some of your teammates have been here for almost as long. Some of them have been here with us for like almost five years. And, you know, when you've done five years of security assessments, of, you know, a bunch of solidity, a lot of rust, a lot of go. Uh, I think it's very important to try to get uh, something a bit more exotic, something new uh, into your professional life. And we see ZK as one of those technologies that A, are intellectually stimulating and B, have the actual potential of driving revenue growth in the future. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, we've already had a couple of opportunities to audit ZK projects. And uh, yes, yeah, some, some of them we can talk about, some of them we can't, <laughs> unfortunately. But we're, uh, as, as you know, we, we try to get our clients to publish our work and we'll do the same for these ZK protocols. We'll do my best and hopefully try to convince everyone to go public with, with our work because some of the stuff that has been identified by some of our team members is really interesting and I just want to share it with the world, but obviously NDAs and whatnot, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Super exciting stuff. Um, yeah. Th thanks for coming on and ch chatting, Mehdi. Um, been really interesting to hear your insights. No, thank you. Thanks for having me, Andy. It's been a uh, long, long due. We've been wanting to do this for quite some time and I've had a pretty rocky and busy schedule so apologies for having to reschedule this a couple of times now but um yeah always oh, great chatting to you anyway so yeah just get to do this now in front of a bunch of people i guess <laughs> <laughs>